astronomy event on July 3rd. Um, we're very glad to have you. We hope everyone's staying safe and healthy. Um, for those of you who have never attended a First Friday event, the First Friday astronomy events are hosted by Boise State Physics. Uh, and my name is Brian Jackson. I'm a professor in the physics department here at Boise State. Uh, we're very glad to have you. Uh, the first Friday events usually traditionally have been held, of course, on campus at Boise State. Um, but with the COVID disruption here, we're, we're doing these virtually. The first Friday events take place on the first Friday of every month. So this is the first Friday of July. Um, we will have uh, additional first Friday events coming up throughout the summer. Uh, we have our next one scheduled for the first Friday of August. Um, and for that event being held on uh, August 7th, we're gonna have Dr. Paul Verhaj. Uh, Dr. Verhaj is gonna talk about his uh, experiments in educational work, uh, doing uh, suborbital ballooning. I think it's gonna be a really fascinating presentation. Um, for those of you who are interested in asking questions of our speaker tonight, Katie, I'm gonna stop your screen sharing just real quick because I wanna um, I want to show our, our guests how to uh, ask questions. For those of you interested in asking questions of our guests tonight, oh yeah, no, no problem. Uh, For those of you interested in asking questions of our guests tonight, uh, you're probably looking at a, uh, hopefully looking at a screen that looks a little bit like this, YouTube. Um, and on the right-hand side of the window here, there's a, a chat feature that you can use. You'll have to be signed into a Google account to use the chat feature. But if you're signed into the Google account, you'll be able to ask questions through that window. Uh, and then I will record those questions as you ask them and then relay them to our speaker. Uh, and so hopefully uh, you'll be able to get any of your questions asked You'll also welcome to email me directly um, to ask your questions and I'll keep an eye on my email over the course of the presentation. And of course, any questions that, that we don't get to, I'm sure Professor Devine would be happy to answer your questions um, after the presentation. Okay, and so with that, uh, let me introduce uh, tonight's guest speaker. Uh, Professor Catherine Devine got her uh, bachelor's degree in physics from Carleton College followed by a, and a PhD in astronomy at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, her thesis work there at Madison uh, was in radio astronomy looking at uh, infrared observations of dark clouds in the galactic plane. Um, and we're gonna hear some, some similar science tonight, but I think it's a little, a little different uh, and it's, it's fascinating. Professor Devine is a, is a really excellent speaker. I think you'll enjoy it a lot. So um, Professor Devine, let me get you to share your screen now. Perfect, and, I, and you're on, go ahead. Um, you can uh, unmute your video, unmute your audio. I've, I've unmuted my, vi my audio and I just need to figure out how to show my video. Um, there we go. I guess you have to tell me to do it. How's that? Perfect. Excellent. <clears throat> All right, well, thank you for the introduction, Brian. Um, See, I'm just checking the time here. So I'm gonna give myself a little bit of a timer since we're starting about 10 minutes and I wanna make sure that I leave time for questions. So um, I'll get that started. Um, <clears throat> so I'll be sp speaking about um, what are these yellow balls, um, which is the answer to a citizen scientist question that came up um, while looking at a um, some pictures of the galactic plane. And so the story I'm going to tell tonight is about how people at home doing science um, without much of a science background were actually able to lead to a discovery that has now led to a catalog that has potential for really kind of changing how we think about intermediate and massive star formation, um, which I guess is timely because a lot of us are kind of stuck at home wanting to contribute to science and maybe stuck behind a computer screen more than we would like. And so this maybe in might inspire some of you at home to participate in some astronomy research. Um, if you want to contact me, my email is down in the lower left of this screen. Um, and so if you do have any follow up thoughts or questions, you can always reach me at that email. Okay, so um, before going into the story, I'm going to give you a little bit of background information in astronomy. I really, since I, I only can see Brian as my audience, it's very hard to know the background of who I'm who I'm, I'm talking to right now. Um, and so I'm going to provide, I'm going to assume that you're non-astronomers, um, but I do, 
if you are an astrophysicist watching, tuning in, um, there is some some um, some hard science for you at the end too. So hopefully there's something for everyone here. But I'm going to assume that you don't know much about astronomy and kind of start from the beginning with some terminology. Um, so what I do, I study star formation. Um, which is how stars form. I study it in the Milky Way, which is our own home galaxy. So I, as far as astronomy is concerned, that's pretty local. I study star formation close to home in our own Milky Way. And I primarily do it by looking at infrared and radio light. And so for the first part of the talk, I'm going to break down um, what all of that means. This is a picture of our Milky Way for those of you who haven't really thought about where we live in the universe um, much before. So we live in a spiral galaxy. The sun is right here. Um, and the reason I want you to kind of have this mental picture of a Milky Way is that the Milky Way is shaped kind of like a plane or it's like a disc, like a Frisbee or a plate. And um, we're looking down in this image, down into the plate of the, of the Milky Way. And you have to remember that that means that this has to be a drawing. There's no way that this can be a photograph of a real Milky Way because the Milky Way itself is about 100,000 light years from tip to tip. And a light year is a measure of distance. It's how far light can travel in one year. So just kind of to give you a sense of perspective for that, light can travel around the diameter of the Earth seven times in one second. So if light can travel around the whole Earth's diameter um, in, in um, or sorry, circumference seven times in one second, imagine how far it could possibly travel in one year, and that's a light year. So the Milky Way itself is about 100,000 light years across. So to be able to take a photograph of something like this, you would have to be hundreds of thousands of light years away from the Milky Way, meaning that light would have had to travel from a, like a hypothetical camera for hundreds of thousands of years to reach the Earth. So this is, this is a picture. We have no way of actually seeing the Milky Way like this. So keep that in mind because I'm going to show you a lot of pictures later in this talk of the Milky Way and of the disk of the Milky Way. And I want you to keep in mind that all of those pictures of our Milky Way that we have are taken from our perspective right here on the sun, looking through the Milky Way disk. So we're looking into the plane of our Milky Way from our perspective trapped here on Earth around the sun. Okay, so that's the Milky Way. Now the next part is star formation. Um, Stars form in the interstellar medium. And so space is really big. Hopefully I convinced you of that in the previous slide. Um, but it's not empty. So the stuff between the stars, um, there's a lot of dust, a lot of gas, and we call that the interstellar medium. And the interstellar medium is interesting to people like me because it contains the ingredients from which stars will form. And so these dense clouds of dust and gas go on to later form stars in the densest areas. So this is just kind of a crash course image of how we think stars like our sun form. So lower mass stars. We think that they start out as a big dust and gas cloud and that something happens to trigger parts of this dust and class, gas cloud to get a little bit denser than the surrounding regions. And if they're a little bit denser, that means they have more mass, which means they have a little bit more gravitational attraction on the areas around them, which means that they gather more mass. So it's kind of like forming a snowball. The more mass that you have, the more mass that you have, the more gravitational attraction you have, the more mass you're going to gather. And so we call that fragmentation, where parts of the cloud start to fragment apart and form smaller um, individual star clusters or st uh, star clumps, so protostars. Um, so this image here, so this is a cloud that's going to go on to form many stars. This is an image here of a single star forming in there. So after about a million years or a couple million years of fragmentation, these individual stars last. And this time, this, these numbers here indicate the amount of time that the protostar spends in each stage. So fragmentation takes a few million years, a few tens of thousands of years um, for that individual stars, for the gas to collapse down. And as it collapses down, it's giving up gravitational energy. And that energy then converts into kinetic energy. Just like when you drop a ball, it speeds up. And so it gains kinetic energy. But when you're doing that on the molecular level, faster molecules means higher temperature. And so what's effectively happening is this gas cloud, as it collapses down, is getting denser and hotter. And eventually, it gets so dense and hot in the center that fusion can begin. And then you have hydrogen forming into fusion. That's what fuels a star. And you get a star like our sun. That's the very abbreviated version. I could spend an entire semester teaching a course on just this slide. Um, but the upshot is that for decades now, astronomers feel like we've gotten a pretty good handle on how you form a star like our sun. It follows this, this picture right here. Um, and we've been able to account for, for jets and disks, and these disks are what go on to form planets like our solar system. And, and so we feel pretty good about that. But there's a problem with this model in that it does not scale up to very massive stars. And so 
<clears throat> Astronomers talk in solar masses, um, which is a unit of mass, which is just proportional to our sun. And so one solar mass is a sun, a star just like our sun. Um, so we think that, that this picture that I just showed here works pretty well for stars with masses comparable to our sun um, and less massive. But once you get up to five, six, ten solar masses, it doesn't scale very well. And so that means that you can't, um, there's, there's issues, there's feedback, the hotter stars, um, massive stars form a lot faster. They're a lot more energetic, which means that there's feedback, they're giving off a lot of radiation, which should push material out. So the question was like, how do we form, get all that mass, 10 times as much mass to form 10 times quicker. And so we had to come up with different models basically for massive star formation. And so it's still a little bit of an open question as to how you form these really massive stars. Um, and part of the complication there is that it's very hard to actually see a star forming. If you'll see um, here, yes, they spend a few tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of years in each of these star formation stages. It's even faster for more massive stars. But in the time scale, like when we're talking compared to how long a star lives, which is billions of years typically, um, those those early stages of star formation are kind of over and done in a, in a flash. And, they're, and it's even faster for massive stars. And so seeing young massive stars is actually exceptional hard. They, they don't, they're, uh, massive stars are relatively rare for every star like our sun. Um, there's hundreds of stars like our sun for every massive star. Um, and they, they uh, form very quickly. But then they're also embedded deeply in the dust and gas clouds that they form from, from the interstellar medium. And so there's all these complications. They're hard to find and they're embedded way down deep in the dust and gas in our interstellar medium, meaning they're hard to actually get pictures of. Um, so they're tricky, but they're also important because massive stars are what blow up as supernovas. And supernovas are the things that provide all the metals. Um, so if you're wearing any jewelry that's made of metal, if you have any iron in your blood, which you do, all of that came from a massive star going supernova. And so we would literally not be here if it wasn't for the existence of massive stars. And so for astronomers who are interested in the origins of how solar systems like ours came to be, how you form a Milky Way like ours, how you kind of, go from the Big Bang and then create something like like what we live on now, we have to understand how these massive stars form. They are also really important um, as young stars because they're very energetic and so they can actually be very disruptive to their environments. And so if we want to understand how you form a galaxy, knowing the role that these massive stars uh, play um, while they form and while they die and while they're alive is really crucial. Um, and so massive stars are very important and therefore I'm interested in figuring out how, how they form and what do they do to their surrounding environs while they form. So um, this kind of is a restatement of that. Um, this is a picture of a uh, yellow ball cluster, which I'll talk about a little later. But this, I like this background picture because it really it illustrates well that interplay between, we've got some young massive stars, these yellow, yellow objects here forming. And we think that these bubbles, these red glowing bubbles were actually carved out by young massive stars. And so we can see this glowing um, green traces the interstellar medium, but it's literally being shaped and blown around by the young massive stars that are forming here. And so these massive stars stars, even though they're relatively rare compared to all the other stars that form with them, um, they play an outsized role in kind of controlling and bullying the interstellar medium and, and, and causing other all sorts of interesting behavior um, in their environments. Okay. So before we continue then, I do want to go back to what we see when we talk about the Milky Way. So I said at the beginning of the talk, I study star formation in our Milky Way at radio and infrared wavelengths. So I've covered star formation. And now I'd like to kind of talk a little bit about what it means to study anything in our Milky Way. So if you're very lucky and have the opportunity to go out and see a really dark night sky, um, you know, perhaps you're going up to, to Bruno or to Stanley if you're in Idaho or you're out in the ocean, um, you might see something that looks a little bit like this. This is what the Milky Way looks like viewed from Earth. And um, you can see that there's these dark areas here and bright stuff here. And remember that earlier slide that I showed you, we're here. We're here on the sun looking into the plane of our Milky Way, which means that a better perspective might be to think of us looking in this way, where as we look from the sun towards the galactic center, we see this because we see all these bright stars. There's more stars towards the galactic center. And then out towards the edges, there's fewer stars as we're looking out um, further away. And then as we look behind us, there's going to be even fewer stars because we're looking away. So 
behind us is over here on the edge of these images and then towards the galactic center is here. So it's just a really different matter of perspective. And that's what we're looking at in these images here. So you see these bright areas that are the galactic center. And then this dark stuff, at least in the visible wavelength, is not an absence of material. It's a silhouette feature because there's a lot of dust and gas in the plane of our Milky Way, the interstellar medium that I mentioned earlier. And that interstellar medium actually absorbs visible light. And so you can see here that all of these dark areas are actually dark clouds of dust um, that are preventing the light from the background stars from getting through. And so if you want to study star formation or stars that are deeply embedded in this dust and gas, you actually need to use a longer wavelength. And this is why I study star formation at longer wavelengths like inter infrared and radio light. So um, without getting too much into the physics of it, wavelength, the wavelength of light, which determines its color, um, determines how much it is scattered by the medium. So this is the, the physics of why the sky is blue. Shorter wavelength light, so that's things kind of down on this end. This is the wavelength here. So gamma rays are the very shortest, x-rays, ultraviolet, visible. So in the visible spectrum, violet, blue, green, those are the shorter wavelengths, and red are the longer wavelengths. So shorter wavelength light scatters more than longer wavelength light, which is why the daylight's, the daytime sky to our eyes is blue. That shorter wavelength of blue light gets scattered more than the red light. It's also why the sunsets are red. And so if you've got the sun low on the horizon, the sunlight is traveling through a greater column density of air. There's more material to scatter the light. And the only light that gets through is um, the red light. Um, OK, so why infrared and radio? So if you look at this image here, you can see the Milky Way plane. So again, this is that picture of the Milky Way. So here's looking behind us, here's looking towards the galactic uh, center. In numerous wavelengths from radio, long wavelengths, we can see some atomic hydrogen here. So this is an emission line in the radio, radio continuum, molecular hydrogen. Now we're getting into the infrared, mid-infrared, which is a shorter um, infrared, near-infrared, which is almost visible. This is optical or visible light, shorter to X-ray and gamma rays. And so the Milky Way was actually imaged at numerous wavelengths in numerous studies over about the last 20 years. Became very, um, I don't want to say trendy, but very, well, trendy. Um, a lot of science was given over to surveying the entire plane of the Milky Way at numerous wavelengths, which means over the last 20 years, astronomers have produced these huge data sets of um, the w Milky Way plane at multiple wavelengths. And then the challenge becomes, well, what can you do when you combine those surveys? And honestly, that's what I've spent the last 15 years or so doing is playing around with this survey data. So the work that I do is from a mid-infrared um, survey of the galactic plane. It's called the Galactic Legacy Infrared Mid-Plane Survey Extraordinaire, or GLIMPS. Um, and so the GLIMPS survey surveyed the entire Milky Way plane. Um, and if you want to get a sense of how much data there is, I encourage you to go to this website here. Um, I'm just going to do a little walkthrough. So there's a little viewer. It does require um, flash, which is unfortunately going out of date. But let me just show this video of what this website does. And if you want to play around with it while you're talking, if you're bored with my talk already and you want to do something in the, um, in, on your other screen, you can go to alienearths.org and glimpse. And this is what it looks like. So you launch the viewer. You do need Adobe Flash, so whatever it takes to get that to run on your computer. And it'll bring up this viewer. And this is using Glimpse data. And it gives you a sense of just how many images there are. So you can scroll around, zoom in, zoom out. This is facing towards the, the center of the galaxy right now. Um, and you can scroll along the Milky Way plane. And there's all these images here. And then I'm going to zoom in in just a minute just to give you a sense of how much data there is. So we can go to this big, this is the most zoomed out frame that we've got. And all of those little push pins indicate objects that have been studied. So you can push on some of those push pins if you're playing around with this at home and find out a little bit more about some of the objects that have been studied in greater detail. But as you zoom in, you can just start to get a sense of these are really high resolution images. If there are any astronomers listening, the, the um, resolution on these images is about three arc seconds, which is actually very good for infrared data. Um, and this covers the entire galactic plane, 360 degrees all the way around, um, plus or minus one degree above and below the plane. And then in galactic center, you could see it actually went a little bit higher. And so um, I invite you to kind of play around and appreciate just how much data there is here and how many objects there are to discover. So this um, survey began a couple months after I started graduate school in 2009. 
Um, and this, uh, the first data releases really started getting, or sorry, not in 2009, in 2003. Um, and so a lot of the, these analyses of these data came around 2003 to 2000, the next 10 years after that. But people are still mining these data sets that are now almost 17 years old um, and, and finding lots of interesting data in there. So how do you go about, let's end this video and go to the next slide here. Um, how do you go about finding things in a data set that big? Uh, which, you know, when I started in 2003, um, the first two bullet points here were kind of the strategy. So you find a few objects that look interesting. So for example, infrared dark clouds, which is what I did my PhD thesis on. Um, so you find a few objects in those big surveys that look interesting and you just pick like five or six of them and study them in great detail and hope that they're representative of the full sample, even though there might be thousands. Or you could find an entire team of undergraduates and make them find and catalog all of them and hope that they don't miss any. Um, you know, you could send a grad student to the basement to do this for, for days or years. Um, or you could train the public to do this and turn it into a citizen science project. And that's really the direction that around 2000, the late 2000s, early 2010s, that this, the, these survey projects started going was recruiting citizen scientists to help look through these large data sets and find images um, that find the objects you know, that, were out, that were in these samples. And that's where the potential for overlap between these big surveys and really doing some kind of big data analyses takes off. Um, so let's, if you're interested, I want to introduce you to Zooniverse.org, um, which is a platform for building citizen science projects. And there is really something for everyone in here now. Um, Ten years ago, when this got started, you know, there were a handful of projects and the, they were primarily astronomy. I think astronomy really was the, the, the driving force for these projects. But now there's biology, there's history, there's sociology. So if you're curious, you can go to the active projects and go through and there's geologists have taken over. So there's physicists now, high, you know, particle physicists, muons, solar storm watches, asteroid hunters. And so basically anyone, any scientist who has a project that requires just looking through piles and piles of images and finding things that all look the same um, can put them, can build a Zooniverse project and hope that people will be interested in enough in it enough to participate. Um, you can also go through, there's language and literature. They have people translating old handwritten letters and typing them up and um, transcribing them now. Um, so that's what some of the history is. Um, I haven't played around. I know there was a biology one where you could like look at pictures of the Serengeti and classify how many giraffes were in the picture or something like that. So there's, there's, there's all sorts of stuff on here that's really interesting. Um, so I encourage you, especially if you've got um, budding scientists at home that are looking for a way to contribute, to go on this site and poke around. Um, numerous citizens have gotten credited as co-authors on papers um, over the years by contributing and finding really cool stuff. So that's the next direction of my talk is um, what cool thing did a citizen science scientist find that resulted in the project that I've been working on for about the last four years? Um, so the original Milky Way project, so go back, I'm going to back you up a few slides here to this question. My goodness, there's a lot of data and glimpse. What are we going to do with it all? Um, around 2009, the glimpse project, one of the things people were really interested in from the glimpse project were these things called mid-infrared bubbles. And so if you've, uh, Brian, you may remember the last talk I gave at BSU was about these mid-infrared bubbles. Um, so there was a push then to go through the glimpse data and find all of the mid-infrared bubbles. And this lent itself really well to a citizen science project. So we had to look through all of these images. And so the scientists, the team just put the images from Glimpse online and trained citizens at home for what to look for, for a bubble. And they said, here's what a bubble looks like. It's this green rim with a red interior. If you see one in the image, draw a circle around it. So note it, note them. Um, and then it saved everybody's results and then average them. So this image here shows all of the user's identifications. And so even if somebody was a little bit generous and said that this structure looked like a bubble, but very few people agreed with them, you can see that trends clearly emerge. Most people thought this was a bubble. Most people thought this was a bubble. Most people thought this was a bubble. And so using those kind of aggregate results of, of thousands, I think tens of thousands of users on this one, they were able to clearly identify all of these bubbles in the image and create a catalog of the mid-infrared bubbles that they produced. Um, so this resulted in data release one of the Milky Way project. Um, so the original Milky Way project started in 2010. 
um, with the goal of finding these bubbles. And they released this bubble catalog in about 2012. But while the, while the citizen scientists were looking at these images, they were also encouraged to look for anything else that might be cool or interested in the images and flag it. And so the, the most dedicated uh, citizen scientists had access to basically these chat boards or discussion boards. So if you go into these Zooniverse projects and start doing some citizen science, you'll notice that a lot of the projects encourage you to, if you see something weird, to join, to post it to the chat forum for the project. And so um, there was a, a user um, here, I can't remember, it was Kirby Food. I've never, I have no idea who Kirby Food was, but that was their login name. So Kirby Food noted this, these little yellow ball-like objects, these yellow things. And so he said, yellow object? Is this something like, am I supposed to be calling this anything? What should I do? Um, and then the scientist, the admin for this chat board wrote back and said, if you're talking about that hashtag yellow ball, um, that might be in the, a category we haven't thought of yet. And so all of the users, the kind of dedicated citizen scientists at that point, started noting in the images, hashtag yellow ball, hashtag yellow ball, and they noted about 900 of them. And so the question then from all these citizen scientists is, what are these hashtag yellow balls? Which is where the kind of strange name for the objects I study come from. I study yellow balls. And it's, it's citizen scientists naming the objects through the hashtag is the origin of that story. So in the, within the next three years, um, a team of um, Grace Wolf Chase at the Adler Planetarium and Charles Curtin at Iowa State University followed up on the yellow balls and did a bunch of cross matching. So remember all those other catalogs that I told you about? So all that other data um, from the Milky Way at all those other wavelengths, radio, um, molecular lines, they did a bunch of cross matching with those catalogs and found that these yellow ba balls were highly associated with tracers of massive star formation. So just based on this cross mass association, they were able to show that um, these yellow balls were most likely associated with high mass, early high mass star formation. But they said, you know, we, we don't know for sure and there's some biases in the sample. Um, but the first paper on these objects that answered the user's questions came out in 2015. So this is from the Milky Way Project blog from 2015, and this is the abstract of the project, um, or the, the original paper. And I just like the title. It just it, it, They just took the user's question right there. So there's the, the citizen scientist question, what are you, yellow balls? And they wrote a whole paper to try and answer that question. Um, and I think what's interesting here too is that, um, just to draw your attention, I'm not gonna make you read the abstract in a talk, that's boring, but there's 900 objects in this first sample that they released. And those are just the 900 objects the citizen scientists found serendipitously in the images that they were supposed to be looking at for bubbles and just marking them with a hashtag. And so since the yellow balls really weren't a target of the initial observation or the initial project, um, this initial uh, paper wasn't complete. The other thing to notice here is that they kind of leave that they, they, they are pretty sure they're associated with massive star formation, but they leave this kind of we, we um, suggest that future studies of the yellow ball sample will improve our understanding of these objects. And so those future studies of these objects is really where I come in. I've been working on the future studies to really try and pin down better what the properties of these yellow balls are. And so um, there was another round then of the Milky Way project. A lot of these citizen science projects, if you sign up and kind of get involved with them, you'll notice that they'll say, all of the data has been classified. Thank you for your help. And then three years later, you'll get an email saying, we're back. We have more for you to do. Um, and that's because every time a citizen science project goes, the citizen scientists discover interesting things. The scientists realize they probably could have put the data out there in a better way. So they tweak the project and they re-release it either with the same data but improved tools or with improved data. So in the case of the Milky Way project round two or Phoenix, um, it was the same data, same images, but improved tools with more specific instructions to the users. So now they were saying, we want you to look for bubbles. Um, but we also want you to look for bow shocks and yellow balls. And so yellow balls were a target of the, of the second round of the Milky Way project. And the hope was that this would um, classify much more, or get much more yellow balls in the sample and a much more complete sample of yellow balls. 
Um, in this uh, Phoenix version that ran for about five years from 2012 to 2017, there were over 3 million classifications. Um, and the paper on this has been released so far is by Thurindu Jayasinghe. Um, I just wanted to put his name out specifically because he wrote this paper as an undergraduate. So Brian, I don't know if any of your students are listening in right now, but that might inspire them. I don't even know if he was an astronomy major. I think he might've been a computer science major. Um, and so he was able to contribute meaningfully. He was an undergraduate at Cal Poly Pomona. Um, but there's a lot of undergraduates have contributed significantly to this research. So um, there's a lot of potential, even if you're just starting out in the sciences to, to kind of jump on some of these projects and make a huge contribution. So um, this is what the uh, Phoenix tool looked like. So I'm just going to play a, a run through of how what these citizen science interfaces look like so you can get a sense of the training that you get and you'll get a sense it's not much you don't need much. So usually with this project, you'll go up and it'll say do a tutorial here and so you can show the project tutorial. So this is the amount of training that you would have needed to do to be part of this project. So it would train you how to, how to, how to mark a bubble. So you draw the circle on the bubble and read through that and you'd say, all right, I know how to draw a bubble. Then it would tell you to look for bow shocks, which are these kind of rounded half bubbles and teach you how to mark those. So say, okay, I know how to do that. Then it would tell you to see if you could find the star driving that. And so you can see there's not a lot of instructions to get trained to do these really impactful projects. Um, and then yellow balls, it would say, look for these yellow knots and draw a circle around them. And then if you see anything else that's interesting, mark it, put a hashtag on it, we'll follow up with it later. And that was the extent of the tutorial. So please don't be intimidated by these. It's really, you know, you can get trained in in 10, 15 minutes and then do some really cool science. And so this is what the Milky Way Project Phoenix, the second round looked like. And this is what users did to mark these yellow balls is they just find an object, mark the center, and then mark off approximately how big it looked in the image. And that was it. And then they'd be done and they move on to the next image. So that was the tool. And from that, Citizen scientists classified over 8,000 yellow balls in, across the full Milky Way plane. And so our new data set now has, and so remember the original data set had 900. So it's gone up almost by an order of magnitude here. Um, and they're stretching across the full Milky Way plane. These are just a sampling of what these yellow ball objects look like. They're kind of small and just nondescript. Nobody had ever noticed them before. But we think that these objects represent a new catalog that traces not only massive star formation, but intermediate mass star formation. And intermediate mass star formation, so intermediate mass stars would be things that are like four to eight times the mass of our sun. And there really aren't a lot of, of catalogs that, that track the location of these objects, even though they are important for understanding the sequence of, okay, we know how stuff like our sun forms. We don't really know how stuff like 10 times the mass of our sun forms, but we're, we're working on figuring that out. But this kind of fills in the spectrum of early stages, observational signatures of early stages of, mass, of massive and intermediate star formation to kind of fill in that sequence with um, observational evidence. And so now that we have from the citizen scientists, the location and approximate size of these objects, the real work begins. Because the research questions that I've been working on are, what are the physical properties of these things? And we know where they are, but how big are they? How luminous are they? How much energy are they giving off? How bright are they? How much light are they giving off at different colors? And all of that will help us understand the really big thing, which is what kind of stars are going to form out of these yellow balls? Do they form individual massive stars? Do they form um, clusters of smaller stars? Like what, what's going on inside the yellow balls and what are they going to turn into? And if we're able to answer that, then we'll have a much better handle on what this catalog represents in terms of, of tracers of early massive star formation and intermediate mass star formation. So the next, this last bit of my talk is getting into the science that I do. That was all kind of the background here, um, talking about how to answer this question. The citizen scientists provided us 8,000 of these objects. Now we need to figure out what they are, what's inside them. The first thing we need is distances to these objects. And so if you're, if you're not an astronomer, um, perhaps you never really thought about how far away the things in the sky are, why this is actually very challenging. So if you imagine, here's Orion, and this is just a little schematic that I stole from one of my astronomy textbooks. Um, but here's us looking out at the, um, what we would see as Orion. So there's Orion's belt and there's Betelgeuse. And we see this kind of flat two-dimensional sky, right? It looks like the inside of a planetarium. Um, even though those stars are spread out thousands of light years apart, 
in distance along the line of sight. And so when astronomers say along the line of sight, that means we're looking out this way. All of these stars are close together along the line of sight, but physically they're thousands of light years apart because they're spaced out in this direction. And it's really hard to tell how far away things are in, um, in the night sky. So distances in space can be tricky. There's a lot of tools for figuring them out, um, but that's a whole astronomy lecture in itself. Um, so I'm not gonna talk about it too much, but here's another reason it's so important. I like this illustration here about why it's so important to know distance, because if you don't know distance, you don't know how big something is. Um, so this is the moon. This is a composite object uh, image that I took from a website, but this is a, an image of the moon in the night sky um, uh, taken by Stephen Rian. And then there's an, the Andromeda galaxy here, an image by um, NASA. And this is, if you could see the full extent of the Andromeda galaxy in the night sky, which you can't, but if you could, it would be about this big on the night sky. And here's the moon. So does that mean that our moon is the same size as a galaxy approximately? Well, no. What it means is that the moon is a lot closer. The moon is a few light seconds away from us versus the Andromeda galaxy is about two and a half million light years away. But because it's so big, it appears, you know, relatively big on the night sky. And so without knowing distance to these objects, it's really hard to say which one's really bigger um, versus which one is, is just, you know, looks bigger because it's closer. And so to account for that, like how big is it really factor, you need to know distance. Um, the way we've done it for any, if there's any astronomers listening in is by measuring the association of the yellow balls with um, a, a, a survey. So again, getting into the galactic plane surveys, we really took advantage of all of these data sets of the galactic plane and combining them in creative ways. And so the Boston University Galactic Ring Survey was conducted in the mid 2000s, around 2006, I think. And they produced um, images of the night sky at carbon with a, an emission line of carp CO, basically. And so it's an emission line survey. And so we were able to look at their big survey data set and combine it with our yellow balls and um, find emission lines coincident with our yellow balls to get line of sight velocity and then match that with a kinematic model of galactic rotation. And so that was a bunch of jargon that was targeted to any astrophysics majors that might be listening in. So if you're curious about how we got the distances, that's how we did it. Um, and just to convince you that I do do some science with this, here's a picture from our paper that's coming out. Um, this is a pilot region. And so we've chosen to focus on about 500 of those 8,000 sources as we figure out our techniques. And so a lot of my day-to-day -day research is just writing computer code to pull apart these really large data sets and compare them with other survey data. Um, and that's what my students do too. And so Leonardo Trujillo, who was an undergraduate at the C of I and graduated two years ago now, um, actually wrote the code that took the yellow ball locations, matched them to the velocity from the galactic ring survey data, and then put it into a kinematic model to find the distances. And these, each little um, di uh, diamond here represents a yellow ball. And it shows the location. So this is galactic longitude across the sky. We're focusing on a 10 degree slice. And then this axis here is distance away from us. And so you can see the yellow balls are kind of clustered together along the galactic, um, the, the spiral arms of our galaxy. And so they trace the spiral arms of our galaxy, which is to be expected. They trace star formation and star formation occurs in the spiral arms of our galaxy. So we've got the distances for these objects. So that tells us how far away they are and then how physically, like how big they actually are. So that's the important first step. But the next thing we have to do is measure how much light these things emit. And that's also tricky. It's not very straightforward because the yellow balls exist in the galactic plane, which is very complicated. And so what this image shows, this is just a little GIF I created. Um, and this is a, a tool that two of my students, Aurora Kosart and Anupa Poidal, um, wrote over the last couple of years. And so in these images here, um, is let's, I'll wait till one comes back up here. So th these are the yellow balls themselves. And here's a cropped image. And then this is showing, this is allowing the user to draw a little circle saying, this is the yellow ball and everything else is background. And then it interpolates over the background. And this shows the background only image with the yellow ball removed. And then this is the yellow ball only image. And so they've written this really neat tool that effectively using an interpolation routine, 
um, removes the background and gives you an image of only the yellow ball so you can figure out the contribution of the light from only the source. Um, there's a lot of a lot of photometry tools that people use um, that just draw rings and kind of do point spread functions. So again, this is I'm speaking to the astronomers in the audience now. The reason we need this kind of complicated tool is that yellow balls are extended sources. They're not point sources. And so you can't just point, point like fit them with the point spread function and assume that they're like a star. So you have to be able to draw a shape around them because they're extended sources. And they're also extended sources on these really complicated backgrounds of the galactic plane. And so being able to really kind of go in with surgical precision and draw around the yellow ball was necessary to get a good clean background subtraction. So we've got how much light these things have. Um, and then the next part here is um, cross matching. So we're able to figure out the distances to these objects. We're able to figure out how much light they're giving off in their colors. And so this plot here is showing what's called a color color plot. And this is an astronomer's tool where we can look at the light at different wavelengths. And so um, the work that I've been doing in the mid infrared actually uses three different wavelengths, 24 microns, eight microns, and 12 microns. And you can use those three different color filters and the amount of light emitted at each of those colors to, to tell some information about your sources. And so again, speaking to the astronomers in the audience, um, these color color plots really can separate out the objects. And so these dashed lines here from a previous study looking at each two regions. Each two regions are formed by young, really massive stars. So B type stars are earlier, so massive stars. And so anything kind of below the cutoff in this region is probably an H2 region. And then this box here indicates the average H2 region from this study. And so things up here are the most likely to be hot, massive stars. <clears throat> so each mark in this figure is one of our yellow balls. But each color here represents whether or not it cross matches with an object in another gal galactic catalog. So remember I told you that in the early 2000s, um, surveys of the galactic plane were really trendy and popular. So there's all these other data sets out there of, for example, all of the H2 regions in the galactic plane, all of the overly red objects from the RMS survey in the galactic plane. Um, and so this is just showing association with the WISE H2 region study and the RMS um, excess red uh, sources here, which are the, the um, most likely to be massive stars. The take home point for the non astronomers here is if it has a color associated with it, it's probably already been identified as a massive star. And that's showing that a lot of our yellow balls, especially the ones up here, really do cross match with massive stars. And that's consistent with the work that Charles did in 2015, that original What Are Yellow Balls um, paper. They were looking at things that cross matched. And so they caught all of these, these objects. But here's the cool thing. In our new study, using those 8,000 objects that the, or sorry, the 500 of the objects that we're looking at from our pilot region here, we're seeing this other large sample. Most of our objects are down here, where they're either showing no association with H2 regions or these excess red sources, or associations with things that were identified as radio quiet, meaning that they didn't show up as um, H2 regions um, or giving off radio sources. And so this is showing that a large part of our sample is actually probably intermediate mass stars that aren't going to go on to form um, these ionizing regions um, and aren't going to go on to form these massive stars that will eventually go supernova. So <clears throat> cross matching with other surveys is really important. So the take home point of this is a lot of the science that I'm doing is possible because of all of these massive data sets that people took of the galactic plane that can be combined in really creative ways. And the possibilities are endless. So even though these data sets are now getting to be 15, even 20 years old, there's still fresh results to be mined from them, um, which is really pretty neat. So, <clears throat> so the conclusions then, some of these yellow balls really are indeed tracers of massive star formation, but about 80% of them we're finding are not associated with massive star formation and are instead associated with probably intermediate mass star formation. And we, um, I didn't show it in this talk, but one of the results we're getting is actually combining with yet another survey to get the actual masses of the gas clumps that are associated with these yellow balls. So in the paper that we're probably going to submit by the end of the month, fingers crossed, we'll be actually um, publishing not only the brightness and the distance of all these objects, but their masses as well. So we'll be able to actually pinpoint down not just massive and intermediate mass, but give some exact masses to these objects. 
Um, and this catalog will provide a huge new data set um, for both massive stars, so it'll be useful as a new tracer for massive star formation, but also for this kind of unexplored region of intermediate mass stars. Um, there's not a lot of catalogs that you can just say, oh, those are tracers of intermediate mass star formation. So this catalog will actually kind of fill a unique role for those. Um, so the next step is once we've refined our pilot study for these 518 sources in our 10 degree pilot region is to expand this out then to the other 7,500 sources um, in the sample. And the most time consuming part of this is that actual clicking around all the sources. Um, so there's actually some potential now for another, yet another round of citizen science contributions to this project to involve citizens in doing that photometry. Because it doesn't take that much training to identify what a yellow ball looks like and to click circles around them. Um, but it does take a lot of time. And I would much rather have 500 people do it for one minute than me do it for 500 minutes. Um, so we're hoping to develop a tool that will let us involve the citizens or at least some introductory astronomy students in this research. If I have convinced you of nothing else, I hopefully have gotten across through this talk how really cool citizen science is. Um, so again, I urge you, no matter what your interests are, um, there's probably a project on here for you to go to thezooniverse.org and start exploring some of the, the citizen science opportunities that are there. And keep checking in, get on their mailing list because the projects change all the time, um, which is really neat. Um, you're never going to be contributing to something stale. All the projects, once they're done, they take them down and they um, put up new ones. And so the stuff that's there really is the cutting edge science that needs your help. So with that, I guess I will end and um, take any questions. Great, thanks, Katie. Yeah, we've got a couple questions here. Um, somebody asks, uh, he feels like maybe you answered this question, but I want to ask it anyway, because I think it's a really good question. Um, could you use yellow balls as, as sort of astronomical standard candles? And maybe you should first explain what a standard candle is and then, and then answer that question. Yeah, so a standard candle is something that has a really constrained brightness, and those are, are useful, or sorry, luminosity, a really constrained luminosity, meaning that they all give off roughly the same amount of energy. And those are really useful to astronomers because if you know a type of object gives off the same amount of energy, then you can use that, like how bright it should be at a given distance to figure out how far away it is. Um, with that in mind, yellow balls are bad standard candles. Um, and so it's a very heterogeneous sample is what we're finding is that these yellow balls um, seem to span quite a range of luminosities and colors and masses. And so the one thing they have in common is that they are emitting both at eight microns and 24 microns, which is why they appear to be yellow in these mid infrared images. Um, but it appears to be that there's a lot of different types of stars that can cause at least a range of stellar masses that can cause that yellow glowing. Um, and so the short answer is no, we don't think they have a very consistent luminosity. Um, they probably have a range, but they would not be a good standard candle. Great question. Sorry, I've gotten so good at like muting myself when I'm not talking. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I have to ask you this question because I, I can just imagine a student of mine asking this question. If I showed them a picture of one of these yellow balls and I said, um, you know, what is that? I'm sure that their first reaction would be like, well, that's just a star. So how, how is it you know that these are not just, just some star? Right. Um, so they're glowing. So we, there's a lot of ways to answer that. Um, the, the, what we see from a star would be much more point like. Um, and so these things are, are much more extended. Um, and so it's much more likely that they are a dust and gas cloud with embedded sources in them. And again, the yellow emission is coming from, let's see if I can bring up a nice picture of a yellow ball here for you. Um, so this is showing the three wavelengths. And so um, I should have pointed this out earlier, so I'm glad we're talking about it now that, you know, when we're talking about colors in mid infrared, none of these colors, you can't see anything in the mid infrared with your eye. And so astronomers take these images at different filters. So we've got three images here stacked on each other that are at 24, 8, and 3.6 microns. All of these images are infrared, so redder than red, right? Um, and so when we take them into a computer, we just assign them colors. And so it's kind of a standard astronomy procedure to take your shortest wavelength and call it blue, and then the middle one green, and then the longest one red when you're making these three color images. But keep in mind that these are false color images. They're, they're um, reassigned colors so that we can see them with our eye and talk about them. So with that in mind, when we create these false color images of the glimpse data 
with the 24 micron in red and the, the eight micron in green, that's when these things glow green, or sorry, glow yellow. And it's because we have this, this um, double glowing of 24 and eight microns. And you can see it's extended. So if you look here, Brian, to answer your student's question, um, stars look like, more like point sources. Um, and so in here, there's probably actually multiple stars forming. Stars very rarely form just as a one-off by themselves. They almost, we think that almost all stars form in clusters. And so there's probably some extent of clustered star formation within each of these yellow balls. Um, but what's really interesting about yellow balls is they likely represent the stage that's kind of just at the cusp of still being embedded and showing their stellar content. And so if you look at the eight micron images only, this is a, you can see here in the eight micron. So in the eight micron, the very shortest wavelength, we actually start to see a little bit more of the stellar content for these sources. And so they're kind of these interesting bridges between embedded clusters where you're just seeing the glowing of the cloud and becoming, you know, becoming a cluster where you can see the individual stars. And so one of the next steps that we hope to do is look at some of the actually the shorter wavelengths, the near infrared for these objects, and see if at least for a subsample of these, we can actually measure the individual stars and like get some, some spectra or something where we could look at what's going on with the individual stars within the yellow balls, but we don't see the individual stars at these mid infrared wavelengths. And did you did you say how big the the balls are physically? Do you know how big they are? I didn't, but I can. They're about a parsec across, and so light yearish, um, you know, a third of a light year. So the average diameter of these objects um, is on the order of like a you know a tenth of a light year to you know the bigger ones being a light year across if they're proto bubbles. So parsec scale, so you know, tenth of a parsec scale. Um. Okay, yeah, that's fascinating. And then I, I have another question here, and this is a question I actually I've asked before, because um, I think it really highlights like the importance of of this human intervention on these kinds of science projects. So um, you're probably familiar with the LSST, yeah. The, uh, and I it's like it's not large synoptic scale so, sky survey, survey, large, so, but, it's, but it's not that anymore. It's like oh, the, oh, it's, the, it's isn't it the Vera Rubin? I didn't think there. Yeah, so the telescope's called, I think called Vera Rubin, or the observatory is Vera Rubin, but then the, the survey ha has some new name, like Legacy. Oh, you're ahead of me. I... <laughs> but anyway, for those of you who aren't familiar, the, the LSST is this, is this enormous project, which I think is slated to start next year, although it's probably going to be delayed. And they're going to image, I don't know, like, like a third of the sky every night, right? It's something, yeah, it's huge. And then they're doing it. I mean, part of the, the, the whole program is to look for changes and so they're doing it not you know they're doing it over and over and over again yeah so they're going to generate like petabytes of data like I, yeah. I don't know, you know over the course of the survey and i think terabytes of data every night so it's this enormous amount of data no one human i, I presume is ever going to be able to go through the whole the the whole data set um and so it, to 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 pull science out of these these images they're going to train computers to, to to look for very specific kinds of signals oh, i'm interested in this kind of signal so i'm going to teach a computer how to find it um and I think one real problem with that approach, um, of course, it saves a lot of time. But if something really unexpected pops up in the image, the computer's not going to know to look for it. And so you, I think you phrased this exactly right in your uh, talk earlier when you told uh, the citizen science involved with this project, this project here, tell us if you find something interesting. Mm -hmm. Teaching a computer how to find something interesting is basically impossible. So how do you think we're going to address these like large data sets in the future? Um, how are we going to teach computers how to find interesting things? Oh, that's a really good question. I don't, I don't have a great answer for you. Um, but I think, I think what you're, you're drawing on there is, I think there's a lot of, especially computer scientists, when they hear this kind of talk, they're like, well, you know, machine learning. Why aren't you just doing machine learning? There's a lot of, a lot of interesting interplay between machine learning and these citizen science projects. In fact, um, so I'm answering a question that's not what you asked because I don't know the, or I don't know the answer to your question, Brian. So I'm going to talk about something else. <laughs> Which is, I think that these citizen science projects, um, you know, it's not, they don't have to exclude computers doing some of it, but they can be used to teach computers to do things in interesting ways. So I, I don't know much, I've never done any computer programming that involved machine, that involves machine learning, but as part of this Milky Way project with the bubbles research, so um, the paper that came out in 2012, they actually did go back and do a machine learning component of that. And so that's been published too, where they took the citizen science um, identifications and use that to basically train a computer for what a bubble looks like. Um, so I don't know if there's a, if there's any way that you can teach a computer through machine learning when your algorithms fail, flag it. Um, 
if that's possible or not. Um, that would be my, you know, my naive approach would be teach a computer to, to flag something if it doesn't know what's in it. But I don't know if that's possible or not. Um, but I think that also kind of gets to the like, why do we still in this age where we think that computers can do everything? Why do we still need human eyes? And it's, it's that some of these things are really subtle. And if we, especially with these new data sets or like, for example, transcribing old handwritten Civil War journals or what have you, um, they're, they're, you know, it's, there's stuff in there that we don't know how to teach a computer to do that yet. We just don't. And so getting that, getting the citizens to do that, getting people to help with it. And sometimes your results are going to be used to train a computer to do it, but we need the people to do it first. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, it was perfect. I just, I wanted some, some speculation from, <laughs> from you on that question. Yeah. And well, and I, you know, I don't know if you've had anybody come in and talk from the LSST for a while, but um, I have some people, I have some names that if you're interested. Oh yeah, we should do that. That would be a lot yeah. of fun. Um, yeah. We have, we haven't had anyone. Um, yeah. I don't think we've had anyone from LSST come out and talk. So that'd be, that'd be awesome. Um, well, great. Thanks so much, Katie. I really appreciate it. And we have some, like I said, we have uh, some folks on the, the live stream who've been sending in questions and commenting. So we've definitely got an audience. Um, okay, yeah, are there if there's any more questions, I'd be happy to take a few more too. If you, um, I think no, I don't think I have any other questions here. Okay, great, and thanks for pushing through your cold. I can tell <laughs> <laughs> nothing a little ginger tea can't help. Yeah, you could kind of this is probably more talking that I than I've done to like other people since class has ended, so it's it's good. <laughs> All great. right, well, thank you so much, Brian. Sure, and let me let me get you to stick, stick around for just a second. I'm gonna um go ahead and unshare your screen for me. Um, okay, great. And thanks, folks, for, for coming tonight. Um, as I said, we're going to have our next event, our next First Friday Astronomy event will be on August 7th. We'll have Dr. Paul Verhage come in to talk about his uh, suborbital ballooning. It should be a really great uh, presentation. Take care uh, and stay healthy.